This is very nice standing. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we pray now as always that your written word would be our rule and our guide, your Holy Spirit, our teacher, your greater glory, our supreme concern. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, please do sit down. I've got your uh, service sheet there. Let's turn back to that uh, lady that Peter just brought for us and the Philemon. When I was uh, about 14, a very close friend and I, uh, who went to school together, we decided to buy a tandem together so that we could cycle to school together. <laughs> Friends, this is that. Sorry, <laughs> got the tissues ready. Um, when it came to pay for it, my friend said he had money, money, so I paid the whole amount. Uh, and then, uh, first of all, he never gave me the money. Uh, and he never actually got on the tandem with me. I was the first person in our school to be able to get off the lift to school on the back of my tandem. But as a result, our, our fellowship, our friendship just broke up. Uh, and a number of years later, I still remember this and I still feel sad about it and, and we know the relationships do fall apart we know that friendships get broken and we know that that can happen in a church as well and unfortunately it happens all too often in churches the relationships go sour and at the heart of this letter to philemon that we look at this morning is how we as christians relate to each other when things have gone wrong when someone's done something to us, or we've done something to them. Now, you may be thinking, hey, we've, we've been going through Colossians, why are we in Philemon? Well, the letter to the Colossians was probably read in Philemon's front room. The church probably gathered together in Philemon's front room. And one at the end of the reading, there's reference to Epaphras, who have been the one who brought the gospel to Colossae. So we're still in that sort of Colossae type situation. He was Philemon. He was a very rich man, uh, and he had Onesimus as a slave, but Onesimus had run away. And he probably stolen from Philemon before running away. If you look at verse 18, it says, If anyone has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Onesimus had then ended up in Rome. And there he'd met Paul. And he comes back. And the big question in the letter is what happens now? What happens now? Paul was a prisoner in Rome, and he would like to keep Onesimus with him, as we see in verse 13, where he says, I would like to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But he thinks it's right to send Onesimus back to fight him. Now, please. Let's not get hung up on the whole thing of slavery. That's not what the letter is about. He wants to send Onesimus back to Philemon, trusting that Philemon will receive Onesimus favorably. Verse 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. But the big question at the heart of the letter, and the big question in a sense that carries on past the letter, is will Philemon forgive an essence? Will he forgive an essence? Will he receive him back? No longer as a slave, verse 16, but better as a dear brother. And that's the bones, that's the heart of the letter. Paul is writing to, to Philemon to say, here's an essence, there's been a change in his life, I want to send him back to you, but will you receive him back? Will you accept him? And the letter revolves around three people, Paul, Onesimus, and Philemon. And as we just trace through them quickly, I want you to think, who do I identify with here? Who do I identify with here? And first there's Paul with his concern for Christian unity. Now, when we read Paul's letters, we may say, well, I don't identify with Paul, because, I mean, Paul's this amazing uh, evangelist and church planter. But we are in so many ways, like Paul, we have the same concerns. 
and we can learn from Paul so much. In verse 8, if you look at it with me, therefore, although in Christ I could be bothered and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. Paul's great concern was for Christian unity. Paul's great concern was to see brothers and sisters who are Christians united together and problems overcome. And so he appeals to Philemon to be reconciled with Onesimus as a Christian brother, to be able to be one together. And Paul knew Philemon, he knew him very well. And verses 4 to 7, they're a blowing testimony to Philemon's faith. He also knew Onesimus, he knew Onesimus had come to faith. And in verse 10, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Who became a son while he was in chains? He's like a son to him. So Paul is concerned that this Christian leader and this new Christian should be brought together as one. He was concerned to see those who are estranged united. That's Paul's concern. I just wonder do we share that concern? Do we share that concern to see Christians who are at odds united? When we see Christians at odds with each other, do we have that heart that says, actually, that's not right, that's not good, it's not honouring to God, it's not building the church, let me do what I can to bring these people together? Do we have that heart about it? See, often when we're at odds with each other, we do need somebody just outside to say, look, the same thing. Let's see if we can sort it out. I remember a couple of years ago, I had a bit of falling out with my daughter. Uh, my daughter, Anna, is a wonderful Christian woman. Uh, and I remember what it was about. Uh, so you can tell how trivial it is, but that's how often things are. They're trivial. Uh, and eventually, Ruth said to me, so, look, this is not good. You know, she's your daughter, but also she's your sister in Christ. Get it sorted. And I always do what I'm told. So, <laughs> yeah, friends, that's a trivial example. But it's, uh, but it is true. Sometimes we just need a nudge to have to say, actually, yeah, certainly, I do need to get this sorted. Uh, Paul was giving that nudge. Uh, and in a sense, we can be like that. We can be like Paul in that. We can offer that nudge to others to say, look, it's not right that you're not talking to this person or that person, that you're at odds uh, with them. It's, it's, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul it commands the Christians in Ephesus to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It's not for all of us to make every effort. So, friends, you know, if we know people, Christians, who are separated from each other, who are alienated from each other, then let's see what we can do in prayer and in words to encourage them to be united. That's Paul with his concern for Christian unity. And then we look at Onesimus. Now Onesimus had been changed by God's grace. Paul's appeal to uh, Philemon was on the basis of what God had done in Onesimus's life. God had changed him. Summed up in verse 10 to 11. Again, look at it with me if you've got your Bible there or the passage open. I appeal to you, my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become both useful to you and to me. Now they may seem odd, but Paul was spelling out look, to Onesimus to find him. Onesimus has been changed. Onesimus has been changed. Formerly he may have been useless, and that's what his, you know, name Onesimus means. Not useless, but useful. <laughs> Formerly he had been useless because he left Philemon. He'd run away and he robbed Philemon. But now he's become Onesimus. He's become useful because God has changed him. God has changed his heart. And he's a different person. And that's been seen because in verse 13, I'd like to keep him with me so he could take your place in helping me. He's helping now, not hindering. He's had a change of heart. There's been a change. Brought about by faith in God, by the grace and power in God. And God 
God has changed them. And perhaps you can identify with that. Onesimus had been changed. He wasn't what he was before. And perhaps you can identify with what God has done in your own life. I'm, I'm sure you can, I hope you can. John Newton knew the change in power of God. Having been a slave trader, he became a Christian minister. And he wrote this, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. I'm not what I hope to be in another world. I'm still not what I once, once was. Sorry, I am, but still I am not what I used to be. By the grace of God, I am not what I want to be. Not what I was. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And I hope we can identify with that. Say, yeah, in my own life, when we think about that last week with our telling our story, this is what I was, but this is what God has done for me, and this is what I am now. By the grace of God. That's the essence of the story. That's what Paul is saying to Philemon. Look, the has changed. He's not what he was. So don't think about him in that last past tense. Think about him now as a dear brother in the Lord and receive him back. It was because of that change that Paul could write to Philemon. And finally, we come to Philemon, who has a question to answer. A friend of mine, whenever he used to ring me up, he spent like the first three or four minutes wondering what on earth he wanted and why he was ringing him. <laughs> and after a while, he said, oh, come on, just get to the point. Tell me what it is. It's a very nice little chat. But uh, with Paul here, you're thinking, come oh, on, you to tell me all these things. You tell me uh, about Philemon's love for people. You tell me about the change in Onesimus. What is it you're getting at? What is your point? And finally, we get to the point in verse 17. Verse 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him, that is Onesimus, as you would welcome me. That's the point. Philemon, you'd welcome me into your house. I'm asking you now to welcome Onesimus. I know he's done. I know he was, but I'm asking you to welcome Onesimus back. Not as a slave to be punished. Not always remembering his misdemeanors and every so often dragging them up and regurgitating them again, but no, as a valued Christian brother and a esteemed friend. And that's the question Will finally we do it? Now, from verse 22, we see that Paul was expecting to go and see Philemon, and Paul knew that if he went and saw him, he'd be welcome, he'd be honored. He'd have the guest bedroom or whatever it was, and he'd be looked after. The question is if Onesimus came, would he be welcomed? Would he be honored? Would he have the guest bedroom or not? At the heart, Paul was asking Philemon, Can you forgive? Can you be reconciled to Onesimus? He has plenty of love. Verse 5, I hear about your faith in the Lord, your love for all the saints. Verse 7, your love has given me great joy and encouragement. He has plenty of love. Can that love now be given to Onesimus? On the basis of that, can you forgive? And that's what Paul says in verse 10. Sorry. I appeal to you now, my, my sorry, first down. I appeal to you for my son Nestor, who became my soul was in chains. Paul is useless to you. Sorry, I missed, I missed the verse there. Uh, oh, it's verse nine. Sorry, I do apologize. I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner of Christ. And that's the basis. I appeal to you on the basis of love. And the love there he's speaking about was the love of God for us, which brought Jesus to his death on the cross. In the gospel reading, we have that reference to forgive our sins as we forgive others. We'll pray later on when Terry leads us in the, in the Lord's Prayer. God had forgiven Philemon his sins. Could Philemon forgive Onesimus his sins? And the Lord was sure he, he was confident. He would. Verse 21, confident of your obedience. I write you knowing that you will do even more 
than I ask. And then God's word to us today is the same. We may have been hurt. And the question is, can we forgive those who hurt us? Now, as you think about that, I wonder who's in that category for you. Is there someone that's wronged you? Someone that you're at odds at even at the moment? Someone who's wronged you? Someone you're estranged from? Some Christian brother or sister that you're struggling to speak to? And Paul says, on the basis of love, I appeal to you, forgive them. No, that's not easy. It's never easy. It's never easy to forgive. I think many of us will know and, and testify that if we don't forgive, it's not necessarily the other person who's hurt. It's us who's hurt. It damages us. It damages our relationship with God as well as our relationship with other Christians. It is very difficult. Very difficult. So I'm not underestimating the difficulty of forgiving people. There were loads of reasons why Philemon shouldn't forgive an essence. And there may be loads of reasons why you feel you shouldn't forgive that other person. But friends, God has forgiven you. God has forgiven you so much more than anyone can ever do against you. Your rebellion against you, your sins against you, your continued hardness of heart. And he calls us, you and I, to be willing to forgive as well. Over the years, I've um, had the sadness of meeting many, many people who were estranged from those that they once had a close relationship to. Often it's within families, parents separated from children, brothers and sisters who never speak to us, but friends have also met Christians. And some Christians in a sense who almost boasted to me, oh, I haven't spoken to him for, uh, for 20 years, and thinking, no, that's not right. And I've had to say that to them. <clears throat> if we share the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that should not be so. And from these words, if we believe that God can change people, it should not be so. Because the person you fell out with five or ten years ago is not the same person now if they're a Christian. And if you're a Christian, you are not the same person that you were five or ten years ago when you fell out with them. Paul's appeal, verse 9. Let me turn your eyes back to it again for a moment. I appeal to you on the basis of love. I appeal to you on the basis of love. Welcome, Onesimus. And this morning, God's appeal to us is for us to welcome back our Onesimus, whoever that person may be, to offer them the hand of friendship and love. Paul was writing. He was writing to Philemon to encourage that to happen. And he's speaking to us today through God's word to encourage us to make that happen. Let me pray. Father, we prayed at the beginning that your written word may be to us a rule and a guide. And we do want to pray that that be so. And if there are people that we are at odds with, may we hear that word and may we receive that word this morning and be willing in the power of your Holy Spirit to act upon that word. Father, just continue to pray for us as a church community that we would do everything to work together for the bond of peace, so that in us and through us, the name of Jesus Christ might be glorified. And this we ask for his name's sake. Amen. Amen.